Welcome to the Photo Flunky Show, episode 116. Truth is, I wasn't really sure it was episode 116. I had to actually go back and start the show over again. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about three, tri- blah, three tips for travel photography. You know, I should probably start the show over again. No, don't. Don't. Because you said three trips and we're I talking about three travel. trips and tips. Uh, yeah, I'm. Hi, my name is William Beam. I'm a professional podcaster. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lee Beam. I'm just here for the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I am sorry for all the shenanigans. It's because Lee has wine. You haven't had any. What, I mean, what's it's, your it's excuse? It's like fumes. <laughs> it's good wine. It must be if it's affecting me and I'm just sitting next to it. Hey, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Despite the lack of quality in this show, we just wanted to say welcome. We really appreciate you. And before we get started with our topic, I wanted to let you know that show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 116. There, see, I did I did. You that did right. it very well. Oh, I'm uh-huh. glad. I'm really okay. proud of you. Also, if you're a Lightroom user and you're into portrait photography, I have a little set of Lightroom adjustment brushes that you may like. They are helpful for enhancing the iris, the whites of the eyes, skin, and brightening the teeth. So you can get those at williambeam.com slash free brushes. It's my gift to you. Have fun with it. Enjoy it. And if you take some photos and process it with it, let me see it. Yeah, share them. Yeah, put a link in the comments at williambeam.com slash episode 116. We'd actually love to see what you've done with them. All right. Today's topic, we're coming up with some travel photography tips for a couple of reasons. One is I know I have been rather heavy on portrait photography because that's been a big part of what I've been doing this year. But I really love and enjoy travel photography. And and Lee, I know you've done quite a lot of your both food and uh, product photography lately, but you and I kind of met because of travel photography. Yeah, we did. We really did. Yeah. And it's something that's kind of just deep inside of us. Every time we go someplace, we end up taking photos and we're looking for new opportunities. And that was one one of the reasons last episode in episode uh, 115, we spoke with a gentleman who has an app called Pixio about how, how to find, you know, great locations. But finding a great location is not really the be all end all of coming up with great travel photography. It's not. I think sometimes it also depends on what kind of style you have. I think I had this idea for travel photography but you have to take photos of the place where you were. And I've realized that my style is going for the details. I enjoy the food photography. And when I went to New Orleans a few weeks ago, I um, I didn't, I snapped a few photos of like, you know, streets and that, and I did nothing with any of them. The photos that I used were because all- those weren't the ones that spoke to you, were they? they? They really weren't. And I realized I'm still showing New Orleans, but I'm showing the way I see it, which is, I will- find my way into some a little interesting place and I'll sit and rummage through little things and I'll just get totally locked into a corner. And that's part of my little experience. And those are the photos that I take. And there are so many different ways that you can take and share your travel photography. And the fact that you concentrate on the details doesn't mean that you're not telling the story. And I think that is a wonderful thing to do because people, I guess when you see a travel photography photo, you want to say, oh, where is that? I want to go there. Yeah. The other thing is like, we, we always say, you know, you want to shoot, was did you say from big to small or small to big? Basically, you want to tell the whole yeah, story. You want to I tell mean, the whole you, story. You, you want to get the shots that I think define the city, maybe from a wide perspective, but the details are really what I think make your story personal. They are, but I, you know, I'm also thinking there's there's a different take on that I'm because I'm I completely agree with that. But I've also realized that some people, and it's not everyone, have a really strong pull towards a certain type of of photography. Like I'm really strongly pulled towards the the small details and I just don't shoot wide. I tend to zoom in, you know, give me a wide angle or a zoom lens. I've had lots of fun with wide angle lenses, but the photos that I love and keep are, you know, the ones where I can kind of get really tight. If you're really on one of the extremes, maybe you're really into your wide angle shots, you might take most or all of your shots that way, but that's the way that you see the story. There's a happy middle ground for everybody in between. It's probably, you know, most people. So it's just kind of having, tell the story the way you see things. Well, this is one of the things that we've been through together in, we worked on uh, something for one of our other blogs, Orlando Local, and we were going to do a story on Instagram spots of Magic Kingdom. And some of the best shots we found are really things that most people probably walk by and never even see it. 
So, for example, we were in, what was it, Adventureland, and I got a uh, Dole Whip. So a lot of people like to go to Walt Disney World and take pictures of their food or their ice cream treats or something like that and hold it up near one of the attractions. So a, a popular thing to do is maybe get like the Mickey Mouse ice cream bar and hold it up, you know, next to Cinderella Castle in, in the frame. Yeah. But what we did with that one instead was we walked over and there was a wall and it had like this little tiny. It was like it was a little, little skull. skull. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm not I'm not really into skulls. But since this is like, you know, Adventureland, it kind of spoke to what the place was. It was the pirate spot. Yeah. And you bring that little Dole Whip over there next to it and feed the skull. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. It's, it's one of those things like, oh, I didn't even know that was there. And that's something that kind of makes you want to go back to a place, even if you've already been there a dozen times. So I never saw that before. Yeah. So I, I I really appreciate that your eye for detail. And you pointed something out that I've missed over and over again. But I thought it made actually made an interesting shot. Yeah. I mean, I knew it was there. I wasn't looking for it. But I guess that, that just that's an example of how my eye is drawn into the small things. And you were looking around for a nice setting. And either could have worked. I mean, we could have had just as good of a shot, maybe taken somewhere else. But we happened to see the skull. First. We did. And yeah. This kind of came out of the fact that I'm in a process of writing an ebook that has uh, 57 travel photography tips or 57 tips for better travel photography. And we're working on this together. And that was something that I know that you've talked about. And I brought as one of the tips in here, you know, was to work on the detail shots. But we have three tips that we're going to talk about out of that uh, collection today. And this is not one of them. So don't pay attention to anything we just said. Well, I wouldn't say that. It was really important. Oh, okay. Well, then, useful. Well, then that's your bonus tip for today. Yes. Extras. All right. So here's one of the tips that I rarely heed. And I've, I'm actually learning to pay attention to this one. And that was the one that's only take what you need. Mm-hmm. And, and Lee's laughing at me because I'm known for bringing like a whole roller board of camera gear for yeah. some of the places I go to. And then have another bag just to carry some of the stuff around with me. Yeah, I don't see that. And well, here's the problem is... I, there have been too many times that I've taken everything that I could imagine in case I needed it. And this is one of Lee's favorite sayings. I'd rather have it not need it than need it not have it. But the problem with that is you've got to lug it. Yeah, but then we also discussed how different my photography setup is to yours. You know, when I packed, okay, maybe I had three or four lenses. I would take them when I traveled. But when I went off for the day, I did not necessarily take all those lenses. Then I would pick a maximum of two. So there would be one on my camera and a spare, and that would be it. And I've never taken something for my photography that I haven't used. I, I can honestly say I've always used everything I took. One of my concerns is there, I don't want to feel compelled that I have to take something with me just because I brought it and I've got to take a shot with it, you know, so that way it felt it feels like it was used. But what I've learned is, I don't necessarily, if I'm going on a vacation for my travel photography, I can get 80% of the shots I need with one lens. You know, that 24 to 70 will Mm -hmm. take care of most of the stuff. The 70 to 200, I really love that lens, but that is a big, heavy lens. And the truth is, I would probably rather now rent something like a 28 to 300 millimeter lens. And I know it's not perfect. It's it's very sharp lens. And I know there's going to be some bowing with it and other issues that I might have to work on in, in, uh, Photoshop later on or Lightroom, but it's so nice just to walk around with one camera body, one lens, and that's what I work with. And I accept the limitations that are there with it and probably have a better time. I'm not worried about changing lenses. I'm not worried about, oh, I left that lens back in the hotel room. I think it's better just to go out with one lens. And honestly, I've got a big, heavy camera body when I've got that D800 with the battery grip on it. That that thing weighs quite a bit. Yeah, I'm getting to the point now I'd like to get you know a, a nice little smaller camera that still can take some nice photos, but not necessarily weigh so much. My issue with taking the camera now is not due to lugging it around. It's actually because of the inconvenience that people cause you when you have a big camera. So if you're not in a tourist spot, you, I just, I'm not in the mood for hassles. No, and one of the places where we used to like to go to take photos was was actually here locally at Walt Disney World. And... There, I'm still getting reports. I got one just th- over this weekend about Disney security hassling somebody because they were taking photos with what they call a professional camera. I mean, it's a theme park. I, it's I know. A, it's a tourist attraction. People show up with cameras. I, I don't know how they pick and choose who they're going to hassle or who they're not going to hassle. But it's that a is, lottery. And maybe so. Maybe they, you're just standing in the wrong place and catch somebody's eye. But really, when I say only take what you need, I'm getting to the point now where it's like, I don't feel like I've got to bring off a a whole bunch of stuff. Because whenever I do, 
ultimately I end up regretting it because I'm, my stuff is heavy. Yeah. I mean, I've had times where I've left the lens that I should have had or that I thought I had. Sometimes I've put the wrong lens on the camera. I thought I was mounting something. Yeah. It was something else. And this happened to me a number of times. Once I get over being really annoyed about it, it's actually kind of fun to just see what you can get with the lens you didn't plan to take because well, it throws all your plans out. So you have to approach things differently. That's one of the reasons why I say, you know, take one lens, you know, that can handle situations and work within that lens. Mm -hmm. I I go back to that trip to Cuba and I've realized, you know, Joe McNally went out there with one lens, a 28 millimeter lens on his camera. I thought, seriously, that's all you brought? And I thought, this is a guy known for bringing all sorts of heavy gear and, and equipment with him. But he was walking around, you know, for a day of shooting with just that one lens. And he thought, I'm going to work with this lens. And I think that's actually a nice and interesting concept. It's like, how can I use this lens to get my shots in a, in a new location? Now, mind you, I'm talking about something that you're probably doing for, probably for entertainment or for vacation or something personal. If you're going to take travel photos for work or for an assignment or maybe hoping to sell them, then... Yeah, that's, that's a different well, story. Well, keep in mind what I said, only take what you need. If you're doing that, you need more. Mm -hmm. But if you're not making any money off of these photos, do you really need all that stuff? Well, a lot of the time when I just go out and put one lens on, I sometimes I put on a lens, I just literally pick a lens. Like I went out one night with a wide angle lens. I've gone out with a kind of 50 millimeter lens. And that's all I had with the camera on the strap on my shoulder. Sometimes people look at you and say, is that all you brought? Or one of Disney's own photographers i remember i was running around taking photos while he you know he was taking his photos and i was out of the, the way taking photos from the side there were photos of my daughter by the way <laughs> he looked at me and said to me why did you just bring the lens he said with no zoom or anything and i said to him because you guys are getting all the photos that i would have got with the zoom lens i said so this gets me a chance to get something different yeah and he looked he just looked at me like this was the first time he ever thought about it but that's kind of why I'm saying only take what you need. Now, your needs may be different from one trip to the next. It may be different than mine or it may be different than Lee's. But think about what you need and do you really want to be lugging around the rest of the stuff? Because when you're going on travel photography, particularly if you're walking through places, your mobility is a key asset, yeah. probably more so than a bag full of lenses. And dragging a bag on wheels. Well, first of all, some places don't let you do you pull along bags, you know, some private or, places? Or some, some locations, it's really not practical, like some of the cobblestone streets that you can yeah. find in older cities. Our next item on the list is sometimes you have to spend time in a location before you understand it or before the locals accept you. And I know for Americans, a lot of us go on these little short trips and maybe up to a week. That's not really a lot of time to spend in a location to really understand what's there or to kind of meet and get used to the people that are there and then they can start accepting you and giving you some insight as to what you can really capture that different or beyond what the average tourist is going to find. You kind of want to get a feel for the, the personality and the character of the place as well, because you can find ways to let that show in your photos. You, you can find ways to reflect it. Those aren't the right words I'm looking at. You know what Maybe I mean? Maybe so. Let me give you an example. Like in Chicago, there are old parts of Chicago, and I haven't been there in a few years, but I remember I used to go to the same restaurant just to have lunch every day because it was for what, for what I was doing there. It was convenient. It was in the right place. And I kind of got to know the people who were working there at first, you know, I'm just like any other strange customer in there. They don't know me, but when they see you over and over again, they kind of start to accept you. They kind of start talking to you. They ask you questions mm -hmm. and then you let them know that you're interested in photography and they might say, Oh, okay. And they kind of accept that. Then maybe you can bring your camera in there because if you walk in the first day and think, oh, this is a cool restaurant, I want to go out and start taking pictures, they'll probably say, hey, you're going to be disturbing the other guests here. But if you want to get some interesting shots, maybe because you chose that restaurant because it's interesting, yeah, get to know the folks, let them accept you, and then they might be a bit more accommodating about what you want to do. Well, suddenly they kind of, you've almost proven that you're trustworthy. And that takes time. If you're just, you know, breezing in town and out for a weekend, well, you're going to get the typical shots that most tourists get. But if you want to get something different or something beyond the normal thing in a city or whatever location you're going to, you need to spend some time and, and understand how the place works and let the locals accept you. I, that's true even if you're into wildlife photography, because if you show up, all the animals are immediately going to go quiet. 
Yes. They're not going to go through their routine while you're around. No, you've not. got to sit there and be quiet and let them get acclimated to you before they go back to their regular routine. Yeah, that's that's very true. You're used to spending, you know, you spent weeks at a time on your vacations. Yeah, we do. And you got to know people at, at your when you went on vacation. It wasn't like you were just walking in like just another tourist. You got you went to the same place year after year. And you got to know people there and they recognized you when you came back. I did. And that, that really helps, you know, going down at one o'clock in the morning till we would go to bed and I could see where our room was, go down into the the, the main kind of the, the lobby area, the lobby area. Yeah. And I would stand there and take photos. And, you know, people were actually, some of the staff would offer like, do you need us to move this? Is this in your way? They would not do that for me if I'd breezed in for the first time and they didn't know who I was. No, and you can't go in there barking orders out. It's like, you know, I want to take this picture, but I really don't like this chair. Could you move that, please? And they're yeah. going to look at you and say, well, the chair is where the chair is. Yeah. That's where it's Look, I do to move be. stuff, but I move stuff that's movable. I don't move stuff that's being carefully set off. You know what I mean? Like some, some chairs that are designed to arrange around a table, I'll move them and then put them back. But mm-hmm. yeah, something that's been, you know, a display that's been set up, I'm not going to touch their display and mess that up. No, you're not. If you're there for a time, the, the locals get to know you. You understand how things work. Yeah. And then you also get an idea of when to ask if you have something that yes. you want to bring up because you might get a feel for the rhythm. It's like, okay, I know this is a busy time. I'm not going to bother anybody. But you also know when it's like, it's a little slower now, or maybe the light is just where I want yeah, it to be. Two in the morning is a great time. Two in the morning is a great time. Also, even the weather patterns or, you know, the way the sun rises and sunsets, which one's going to be better, which where their location is going to be. It takes time to find the interesting spot, not necessarily the right spot. You can go to a lot of locations. And, you know, in some places you can just pull right up to the parking lot and take a picture of the pyramids and then be on your way. But other locations, if you want to get something interesting and different than most people get, you need to spend some time there and and understand your location. And that may sometimes mean if you can't, if you can't spend a lot of time in one trip, you may need to take multiple trips. And you find alternatives to things. You know, sometimes you're trying to do something, things don't work out. And as you're leaving or moving, you think, oh, what about this? And I mean, this is just a very vague and broad example, but it happens. No, that's an excellent example because let's face it, whenever you show up on location, nothing ever goes exactly to plan. No. I mean, the weather could be wrong. There could be people in the way there. There could be some event that you didn't know about that's happening. There are a, a million and one things that could interfere with the plan that you had. And you can do your research ahead of time to try and mitigate that, but you're never going to be able to you know, makes the sunset just the way you want it. Yeah. You know, if you get there at a time when it's going to be a thunderstorm the whole time, learn to work with a thunderstorm rather than complain that you didn't get the sunset that you wanted. Well, I remember one evening, we were at Disney and I mean, I was, I just caught this really horrible flu that year. I was so sick. I probably shouldn't have even left my room, but we'd gone to Magic Kingdom. I'd lugged my tripod and I was going to get firework shots that night. I set up, and I sat in my spot for about two and a half hours. I entertained Tove. And the fireworks start, like, as they were kind of, you know, they kind of pipe you into it and mm-hmm. do the introductions and stuff. We just had this torrential downpour. It just suddenly, the heavens opened. And I mean, it was like, I just threw my poncho over my camera and my tripod and I ran. It was like, grab the stuff and get out. Yeah, And I was so upset about it. I mean, first of all, I was sick, so everything seemed exaggerated. But we just sat there and chilled, and I thought, well, there's so much I can do. You know, my camera bag and the camera are weatherproof, but they're not like totally watertight. I wasn't going to stand out there in that kind of weather for it. And about 30 minutes later, what happened was the crowds cleared because everyone scattered. And as the rain stopped, we started walking back, and I thought, well, that's it. I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going back. I've just I've had enough of this. And all the lights, and this place just was just empty, and all the colored lights were reflecting in this wet surface, and it was just absolutely beautiful. And I got one of my favorite photos that night. Um, I, I took a few of them, and one of them became my, my favorite from the set. But I mean, that's something I could not have planned. I, I couldn't have planned to get it, but it was certainly not, that came out of a wrecked plan from what I'd set up to get. But it's also one of those things that you learn spending time in the location. I mean, if you're in Florida, in Central Florida here, where we are, in the summertime, thunderstorms come in constantly and they don't last necessarily a long time. They'll wash everything out and then the steam rises up. 
And then you get these reflections and you get these interesting little bokeh, you know, lights in, yeah. in, in your shot. And it may not be the shot that you thought, but now you understand what there is that's available yeah. in, in that location. Mm -hmm. And that's just the kind of thing that, you know, for certain times of the year in Orlando, that's the way it is. And if you breeze in, like I said, for a weekend, you might just go home angry because you didn't get the shot that you wanted. But if you've got time to spend here, you might be able to get both the shot, you know, when it rained that night and then maybe the next night you don't have a thunderstorm and you get the other shots that you initially planned on. Yeah. And I did, I wasn't like I didn't have the firework shots, but I had something different in mind that night. And, you know, I think back now, I don't even know if I got what I wanted or if I didn't, it doesn't matter anymore. Because you love it. Because I, I like what I got and whatever, you know, that's done. The last tip we're going to share on this show is pay attention to first impressions. Mm -hmm. You like this one. So tell me why. I do, because your first impression is something that, you know, they say first impressions last and it really is true. Even if you change your mind about what your first impression was, you never forget what it was. That feeling or that thoughts or whatever it is that resonates with you the very first time that you're exposed to a new environment or a, a new scene is something that just sticks to your mind. You're not necessarily standing there ready with your camera at the time, but I think if you pay attention to it, you can capture the essence of that in other photos that you're taking during the time you're there. See, that's what I like about it is my first impression is going to kind of direct the way that I end up taking my photos. I may have a completely different perception of a place before I got there. I'm doing all this research. I'm looking at other people's photos. I'm thinking, okay, I understand this. I know what it is. I'm going to go shoot this. Then you get there and something about the place feels different. Yeah. And that's part of what I want to capture in my photography is how does it feel? How is it going to make someone else feel when I see this? Can I capture that and put it in there? You, you were just, like you said, you were at New Orleans just a mm -hmm. few weeks ago. Yeah. What was your first impression? It was very warm and welcoming. It, you know, it was very hospitable. And it, there were there was just so much. It's difficult to put that all into. Like but those are happy. Th but they're happy things. And I noticed that all my photos that I took had kind of warm colors. I took every photo that I took there almost without exception was something that kind of captured that warmth. It was the warmth and the happiness and all of your photos came back with that kind of feeling. Yeah. And I wasn't, it, I didn't consciously think of that at all. I mean, it never really went through my mind when I was taking the photos, but I realized that I just was drawn to anything that captured the, the sort of warm, welcoming feeling that I got there. And your first impressions can be any number of things. It could be, maybe there's like a color tone or palette to the area that you're staying in. And maybe you concentrate on those colors. Maybe it is something about the people that you meet and you incorporate them into your photos. Yeah. It's just, or even if your first impression isn't something visual, maybe it's the music that you're listening to. In New Orleans, you know, you've got that specific, you know, kind of jazz sound yeah. up there. And you think like, all right, what am I getting out of the jazz and how am I going to show that in my photos? Because people think of music with New Orleans. Yes, and, they do. And you got some shots incorporating that music in your in your photos. I did. I, you know, and I only took my phone with me. I decided not to go with the camera. I actually regret that. And I will not make that mistake when I go next year. I, yeah, I, I guess I just felt my way with my photos. And that, that is what I tend to do. We're, we're all kind of, some people have a more technical mind. I kind of just get drawn in by what feels good. And I see things in the moment and, and capture them. If you think about your first impressions, kind of consider, are they what you anticipated or not? Or is there something surprising about the location and the first impression that you get? Or, you know what, sometimes the first impression might not be so pleasant. It's like if you go someplace and there's just a smell to it. Not like Bourbon Street. But Bourbon Street, you know, it's got a smell. But imagine that for some reason you went to India and you got hit with a waft of those spices and curry. Oh, yeah. I, I see. I don't do curry. I, I know. It's something you don't yeah. like. Now, there's beautiful colors in, you know, I've got a friend who just went to India and she took you know, her camera to the spice market. Yes. And she really loved, Gorgeous she really loved the color of, of those shots or excuse me, that those were her impressions. And that's kind of something I think this probably is typical for people that are going, you know, to India looking for that kind of spice market scene. If you go someplace and you get something that maybe isn't to your taste, does that color the way that you want to capture the location? I guess it would probably affect you by putting a bit of a negative slant on it because that it, it's like an association thing. There's that, but you know, one of the things I look at first impressions, let's go back to something else like, you know, Las Vegas, you walk down the Las Vegas strip and there are all these little characters and performers. There are, you know, people passing out cards for arranged dates. Yes. <laughs> for lack of a better word, you, you see all the traffic going up and down the strip and your first impression 
you might have been thinking, oh, there's going to be all these luxurious hotels. There's going to be, you know, wonderful shows and dining, which which is all there. But then you go down to certain parts of the strip and it's just really trashy. Yes. So depending on where you stay, your first impression could be very different from oh, someone yes. who's a mile away from you. I mean, look where we stayed. And then there was the one place where we had to transfer. Yeah. Our, yeah. our last trip, we stayed at Mandalay Bay, which which we really enjoyed. Yeah, we liked a lot. it a lot. And the only reason we left there is because for some reason, the the room rate just skyrocketed the it last night. It was like night. three times the price on the last night. So we went over to Aria, yeah. which is in the middle of the strip. Yes. And it was a nice resort. There was a different experience and vibe there than there was in Mandalay Bay. Very different, yeah. So it, it kind of, I guess it kind of colored our impressions for the photos we were taking as well, too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the aria was beautiful. That was one of the things that I, I guess I noticed as well. It's like when we go to Mandalay Bay, it's a very tropical feel. It's very warm. And one of my favorite restaurants for customer service is there. It's downstairs uh, called Veranda. It's actually part of the Four Seasons Hotel that's there. Yeah. And it's expensive, but man, it is just like one of the best dining experiences. Yeah, we love that. That's our place for our honeymoon. <laughs> Excuse me. And, and it's, it's just one of the best dining experiences I can imagine. We didn't get that when we went to Aria. It was a nice hotel, but it was, you didn't get that warm feeling from our server. It was kind of a, a cold and corporate experience. It really was. Yeah, it, it was like we had a room. It wasn't like we were staying in a hotel. We, we stayed in a room, if that makes sense. We felt kind of detached from everything else, I guess. And there was nothing wrong with it. I mean, on paper, all the boxes were checked. We actually had because we stayed uh what is it, was a club level, we yeah we we had a really nice you know, but just the photos suite. we were taking of but, of our room at Mandalay Bay we got um, a small suite and and you had your favorite spot you know you'd, yes. you'd sit by the large window and and just look out at the city and and that's where you'd go to relax with your coffee and read something and yeah. have a nice time. We took some nice photos of that room. We really enjoyed it. We liked the I don't know some big geological thing that they've got on the wall behind yeah. the bed. We didn't take photos of the room over at Aria. Do you know, I, I took photos because that room at Aria was so impressive. I went in and it was one of those where you go, oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Come look at this. But then you stopped. I didn't do. Well, I never did anything with the photos. I never shared them. I never posted them. I never. They kind of sitting somewhere in my camera roll on my cell phone. Whereas the ones from Mandalay Bay, I did, you know, I kept putting stuff up because this was part of the experience. And I think it was all to do with the atmosphere. It was beautiful and they did nothing. They did everything right. But there was just, there was a personality that was missing, I think, in that room. And, and that was for our first impression. And yeah. because of that, I didn't even bother taking any photos in there. Yeah. It, I mean, we it even wasn't... had the turn down service. You know, we got back and the lights were dimmed and we had slippers and robes and chocolate. And Well, you know, they had this and... wonderful technology. You have the little, it's not an iPad, but they had some kind of tablet. You just push a button, it'll open and close. I wanted to shoot it. The blinds, it'll turn the windows, or excuse me, not the windows. It'll turn the lights on and off. You didn't like that at all. I did not like that. Why did you not like that? Okay, first of all, when I got we got into the room, I was tired. You know, we we were tired when we got in there. As we opened the door, this whole thing was automated. This music started playing, the lights came on, the uh, the blinds came went, you know, came open and the TV was on. There was just, everything was loud and in your face. And I walked in, it was just like, don't just shh. It was almost, it was like an intrusion, like somebody in your space. And I was looking around, I was thinking, where is the damn light? All I wanted to do was shut things off. And there were no switches on anything. And it was just, you know, the smart technology when you walk in, if you haven't been shown how to use it when you get in, then don't do it to me until I've got the control to turn but it off. I think that's what it really was, though. Your first impression was a negative impression. It, it was. We got in that room and it was just an immediate annoyance. Yeah. Even though it was meant to be welcoming and like, look at all our great stuff. It's like, no, just we're tired. We want to just go to bed, leave us alone. And how the hell do we turn all this well, off? I just went into the bathroom and closed the door and said, William, please make it stop. <laughs> and I figured out how to make it stop. I but knew he would. Th those were our first impressions. And that really kind of colored my idea of photography there. I didn't want to take pictures there. Yeah. And that's something, you know, when you're going on a destination and you're looking to take photographs and something turns you off. Your response, I, I guess that's why I'm saying pay attention to your first yeah. impressions because they might actually shut you down or they might inspire you to do something, but they are definitely going to affect you. And if you're aware of them, then you can make decisions based upon how those first impressions hit you rather than just being impacted by them. I absolutely do. And the sad thing is, you're right. I mean, that first impression changed us because we had a, a corner room, so we had this beautiful view. I mean, it was all yeah. the way around, like 180 view. 
we didn't take advantage of it. Anyways, those are three tips that we wanted to share for helping you get some better travel photography. And it's different than what you're usually going to hear. But I think, you know what, there's a lot more to photography than just the technical aspects or the usual composition uh, tips. It's what you take with you. It's who you meet and what kind of impressions you have that really are going to impact the photos that you end up bringing home with you. Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. Show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 116. And we hope that you really enjoyed this. We'd love to have your feedback, what you like about travel photography. And if you've got tips to share, please leave them in the comments for us. Thanks so much. We'll see you again next week. Uh-huh.